accumulate and cause major problems. When you've finished assessing all the risks at your institution, you can feel overwhelmed. Fortunately, there's an upside to this. You have more help available to you than you may have imagined. One of the things that falls towards the end of a disaster plan is outside resources. And this is uh, looking at those outside people, trades, talents, and institutions that would uh, be a benefit to you in the event that you had a disaster of any magnitude, a small or large. And this becomes your resource list. Uh, it could be as much as the nighttime number for your local furnace repairman, uh, the local lumber yard. You do definitely want to have uh, in your resource list uh, people who do conservation work. And I'm not talking the eight-hour list that takes place during the day. I'm talking about the phone numbers of their key staff people who you could reach in the middle of the night, but then reach out further to other institutions similar to yours, museums and uh, uh, regional organizations, uh, conservation, curatorial organizations, maintenance organizations that could provide you with uh, further knowledge or further material. Um, also, not only is your resource list people, your resource list is supplies. None of us uh, have the facilities to carry all the supplies we would use in a uh, disaster or following up a disaster. So where can you get generators or sponges, uh, floor mops? Um, and this is where your other institutions, if they've done their disaster plan, will also have a supply on hand and also uh, their dealers. Of course, while talking with other institutions about their supplies, you can let them know what you have on hand that might be of interest to them. By now, you're well aware that your institution is vulnerable to many kinds of hazards. Now you have to come to grips with the fact that in some cases, not everything in your facility will be afforded equal protection. In extreme cases, some articles will be rescued and others left behind. You can't wait until disaster strikes to decide what the priorities are in your collection. Prioritizing is a part of the planning process, and it's never easy. Clearly, the first priority is to protect the life and welfare of your visitors and staff. After that, the decision-making gets tougher. One of the parts that in many disaster plans is not completed is setting a priority plan, prioritizing what you would do in the event of. Uh, obviously human life would be first, but how do you prioritize what objects you're going to protect in place, what objects you're going to move? And this plan has to be shared with your local responding outside services because in many cases if you're having a major disaster at your site, uh, you as a staff will not be allowed back into that building. So if there are uh, floor plans and photographs of your priority uh, salvage uh, artwork, furniture collection, textiles, they themselves, after life safety, would be very willing to help you. Uh, there may be even situations where they would allow you into sections of that building to start uh, removing items where you want to salvage the first ten items, the second ten, and the third ten within your, the scope of your museum. Not only salvage, uh, many items because they're either fragile or too large could be somewhat protected in place by um, panels, plywood panels or plastic uh, sheathing that could be stored behind a curtain or in a closet that could protect the um, particular high value or fragile object right in place within the museum. Once you've salvaged those items, your plan continues so that you have salvage sites. While you're thinking about how to protect all the articles in your collection, you'll also have to remember that on any given day, not every object in the building may be part of your collection. Those items that are loaned to your museum by other institutions or private citizens uh, should have, and rightfully so, a higher priority. However, we have to recognize in our institutions there may be a historic object or a monetary value object in our collection that would supersede 
a private citizen or another museum. And this is when you're writing the loan agreement. If you are very open and public to the uh, individual who is loaning you that object, they may be willing to recognize that your collection has a far greater value. In prioritizing in a disaster plan, uh, sometimes it becomes very difficult, and this is why the total staff has to be involved. It could be that the building is, uh, supersedes the uh, objects within the building, and you have to set up a plan there. And in some cases, uh, even the landscape may have a greater value than the uh, building or the objects and the furnishings within the buildings. Prioritizing is hard. You may feel like you're being forced to sacrifice things you don't want to give up. But just remember, you're preparing for extreme situations. And you're better off making decisions now, when everyone has time to weigh options and think clearly about what's most important to your institution. The one thing certain about disasters is they won't occur at the time most convenient for you. In a typical scenario, you get a call in the middle of the night. There is a fire at your institution. The curator or other critical personnel are away or cannot quickly respond. So who's going to do what? The answer to these questions is found in the emergency organizational chart. The chart defines the essential roles to be fulfilled in responding to an emergency and who fills each role. Most importantly, it lists the backup for each role in the event that the primary person is not available. In general, the chart should take advantage of your existing organization and chain of command, but redefine functions. So the head of your institution may or may not act as the emergency plan coordinator. Let's look at the functions that go into a typical chart. These are the things that just about every chart has to cover. At the top, there's the emergency plan coordinator who will have responsibility for the entire operation. You'll have a lot of people coming and going under confused circumstances, so a personnel coordinator is essential. Amidst a complex and fast-changing situation, everyone, including the press, is going to want information. So a media coordinator is another key person. Now it goes without saying that someone has to oversee handling of the collections. A protective services manager will be a key person, responsible for the security of the site and all personnel at the site. Depending on the size of your institution, you may further divide responsibilities under these top managers. There may be a transportation coordinator, a building supervisor, or someone solely responsible for relocating art. Regardless of how many positions you have, for every position, there should be a line of succession spelled out in the chart, so it looks like this. We see the position of emergency plan coordinator, and it will be filled first by the director, second by the assistant director, third by the curator, and fourth by the senior department head. Now, if the first person isn't available, we know at a glance who to turn to. If that person isn't available, we go to the next. Another thing to notice is that we use titles rather than names. This saves us from having to constantly update the chart as personnel turns over. Now consider this scenario. The curator lives an hour away and meanwhile the number two person has arrived and has started to perform the functions of collection supervisor. What happens when the curator, the number one person for that position, shows up? The answer is, he or she should report to the personnel coordinator who will inform the emergency plan coordinator that the curator is on the scene. The plan coordinator will decide if and when the curator should take over the duties of collection supervisor. If the curator does take over those duties, he or she will be fully briefed on the situation by the person whose position she's taking. All other key personnel should be informed of the changeover. The emergency organizational chart is a remarkably simple concept, and it works. Let me mention two keys. First, people need to know where to go when they arrive on site. That place should be outside of your main building and should be predetermined. When you arrive, go to the tool shed. If it's inaccessible, go to the store across the street, get instructions there. 
The second key is to understand the roles you may be called on to play, and there may be more than one. To really understand them, you're going to have to practice. Now you've got a plan. Uh, it's no good to just have it in the director's office or in one person's office. Um, a real plan needs to be a practice. It needs to have walkthroughs. And your full staff has to be involved. We always uh, encourage, as the development of the plan goes on, to have a tabletop session. Create a scenario of some kind of crisis and um, sit around the table, literally, and, and walk your way through um, that crisis to, to, uh, to see how it unfolds. And, um, and they're, they're um, very educational. You often find um, problems in, in the plan um, that you didn't anticipate. Again, it's one of those things at a staff meeting. Pull a fire alarm. Uh, call a, a, threat, a threat emergency to see how they will respond to it. And at various times, make various key people on your staff absent. Uh, you could have that uh, training exercise and at the table just tell the director or the facilities manager you're on vacation. You can observe this training but you cannot participate and see how other staff members would react in fulfilling the role that you would normally be doing under adverse or serious conditions. Have your own staff uh, give them an assignment uh, you are now a firefighter, or you are now a, are a senior citizen, you are now a person with a disability, uh, and then recreate that in fact in your museum and have them uh, tell you how they feel under those conditions. Um, bring in a firefighter or a police officer and again do your training exercise and they will share with you knowledge that they have to assist you and what their actions going to be in the event they are called. When you finished your exercise, you'll need to critique your actions. What worked and what didn't? Who needs more training and what kind? And what did you learn about your disaster plan? Virtually every exercise reveals aspects of the plan that need to be improved. Make the revisions, circulate them for comment, and when they're finalized, make sure every copy of the plan is updated and that everyone is aware of the